Good morning, Wararapa. This is Anna Cardno from Wararapa DHB, and this show is Wrap Around Wararapa, which is with you every Wednesday morning on Arrow FM at 9 a.m. And today in the studio, I am lucky enough to have with me Vicky Smith, who works across three DHBs. So that's Wararapa. Capital and Coast in Wellington and Hutt Valley, and she is our disability advisor. Good morning, Vicky. Good morning, Morena. It's lovely to have you with us. And disability is something that um, I've got to confess I know very little about. Uh, other than uh, we know that when we've got multi-storey buildings, we want to have lifts so that everybody can get there, and we're looking at full access for everybody to make everybody equal, so nobody is um, is let down by by perhaps their physical ability or, or inabilities, and that's what um, that's pretty much as far as I know. Oh, and that you can't park in disability car parks. Now I know we've done some really good work in Wararapa around disability car parks, and we will come back to that later in the show. But Vicky's here. I'm going to let you guide me, Vicky, in terms of now. I know New Zealand signed up in 2007 to the United Nations Convention, and uh, and that's what we're kind of beholden to, and where the disability story starts. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about that, and we can make that our starting point for today's conversation. Sure. Um, in fact, I'll just kind of read that um, for you and the listeners, and we can um, start from there. So the purpose of the convention um, is to, quote, promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities, and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. So that is where my job begins. So um, it's about providing um, information, uh, advocacy, uh, promoting accessibility to um, community, uh, curriculum, and quality of life. That's a little phrase that I come up with. So people, uh, all individuals have a right to access things in their community, um, be provided the opportunity for education and provided any supports they need to do that and just a general quality of, of life. Um, yeah, and I, I love that word dignity that kicks in at the end of that quote that you just read about, about what it's all about because that's, I mean, that's sort of the fundamental aspect to it all, isn't it? That yeah. we all have a right to have dignity and have that, as you say, quality of life regardless of how mobile we are or our intellectual ability or uh, whether we have sight or hearing or any of those things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, a lot is missed in the idea that there there are things that we can do um, for people, the supports that we could provide to not just um, allow an individual to maintain, you know, a quality of life, but actually to excel and reach potential, especially, um, you know, in the area of children being able to go in and provide supports or some interventions and um, and, and allow for everyone to, to reach their potential. So it's not just kind of accepting, oh, well, this is where you are, these are your challenges, and good luck with that. But here's what we can provide you so you can go from here to, to hear and you can be your best self regardless exactly yeah, we use that great word thrive don't we and that's what you're saying is that um this is all about making sure that all of us no matter what you know what's disabling us or, or what's um what's in our way what our barriers are we can all thrive and reach our potential and be vibrant and you know all of all of that stuff all of that good stuff yeah absolutely so, so it's, it's about equity equity yeah exactly yeah. and and not just the word because it is kind of a buzzword now equity but um applying equity um, making the changes um, providing the resources and um, those supports those specific things that allow everyone to have um, equitable access to quality of life in their communities and and I suppose one of the challenges for that is the fact that in our everyday lives every business every organization is always busy and while that um, while everybody would would subscribe to that um, priority that we need everybody to thrive and to have what they need to do so mm -hmm. sometimes applying the resources and the time and the energy to make that happen can be less of a priority in day to day so I suppose that's the challenge really isn't it when you're advocating for accessibility 
you probably come across, you, you wouldn't have anyone disagreeing that it's important, I wouldn't expect, but you would perhaps have a challenge in making people aware that this is a priority and should happen now, that we need to sort of overlay this at the front of our thinking all of the time. Well, it's all in the planning and just getting the awareness out there that if you are planning um, to start a business or an event or anything like that to be able to consult with maybe um, a disability adv- advocacy group or something like that in the community. Um, you can always contact me and I can get you in touch with the appropriate people and I can give contact information at the close. Mm-hmm. Um, they can come in and provide um, relevant uh, information, some helpful hints. Mm-hmm. Um, just you know maybe a, a ramp which isn't too much expense but would provide you with such a, a significant number of customers that you you may not have had i mean i know this from personal experience that a lot of people in the community have mobility issues they they won't frequent or even attempt to go into um, a business that doesn't provide accessibility so that is a huge uh, part of your customer base that you are excluding um, and even if you're just talking about cost effectiveness, not even the, the part that's, you know, ethically and morally right to let your community access your business, but just the financial piece, um, that's significant. Um, so know. it's a no-brainer there, isn't it? If yes. you're starting something new and fresh, you're building a business, you're, you're building a building yes. uh, to house your business, or you're setting up an event right. that you make it accessible for everyone, uh, and that seems to me a no-brainer is there some legislation around that though that 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 makes people are, we, are, are people that are um that are building now do they have to make all buildings accessible I, is that one thing that i don't think that there any is any specific law but there is a huge influence in the sense of um councils right. so councils almost um they, even though there may not be specific mandates um, written by the councils or every council, um, they are very open to that community input mm. and the community can influence these things. Um, I don't want to give a specific example because I don't want to talk about any specific businesses, but there's, there was a business in the Wadadapa that recently opened and they, they did not provide a ramp, but because of a couple of things that popped up Um, regarding them not having a ramp, things that um, made it somewhat unsafe because it it was quite close to the street and there were some accessibility issues and um, the council became involved and gently urged the business and the business complied with, you know, making that change so sure. I know our um, we are I think very lucky here in the Wadadapa with the three councils that we have because I think um, they to me from a health perspective they seem very very proactive in terms of doing the best they can for their communities they, I think we've got great councils I do too um, and they while they might not may or may not uh, I'm not sure have a, have a particular um, policy around accessibility they certainly bring it into everything that they do in the top of mind thinking I know there's been a lot of conversation about that recently around how they support that and the, the creation of wellness plans and things like that yes. um, takes into account our vulner- most vulnerable in the community and also uh, people with accessibility issues and you know uh, intellectual and all of those um, sort of disabilities come into that wellness plan. So I know that, um, well I think we're very lucky in that respect with the people that we're working with and part of that I think is, is of course we're the luxury of being in Wairapa, haven't we? But that we're a small intimate community, we all know each other and there's a, that power of persuasion and influence is really huge here. Well, and it's important also to know, as you may already know this, Anna, but um, 25% of our population identifies with some sort of disability. I know. You know what? I've got that on our website at the DH, and every time I see that and, and land on that page and I see that, it's I, I find it quite incomprehensible that it is 25% of the population. But if you consider that 23, almost one out of every four citizens in the Wairarapa are actually over the age of 65, yeah. you can also see how that has an influence. So if that is your population, of course, they're going to have a voice and they're going to want th- things to be accessible to them. Absolutely.
and we have we have got that aging population and we see it um, influencing all things don't we and mm. in, in health in particular but but yeah absolutely that could be a really key part of why Wairarapa in particular needs to be really mobility aware and accessibility aware and all of that good stuff absolutely mm. Mm. And so, what do you um, and with with the group that we have here um, in the Wadawurra, with the people that you're working with on a day to day basis? You were talking about disability advocacy groups and, and things. Is it quite strong here in the Wadawurra? That do we have a lot of disability advocates here? Do we have a group that's local? Um, well, there's um, SIRDAG, which is a sub-regional group, which has members, um, you know, of our Wadarapa community. And um, there are other um, groups similar to that. And then there are also um, NGOs and um, they work for advocacy as well because they want to provide services. So they have a voice. And so there, there is a lot of uh, vocal involvement. There's the Wadadapa, um Community Network Group um, where NGOs come together and a, a significant percentage of those groups work with people who have disabilities or um, people who are in the aging group who mm -hmm. often have disabilities. So there there is a lot of community involvement on different levels. And then mm -hmm. there's my role as well which um, makes me accessible to people um, if, if they have something that they want to change, you know, um, or give a voice to, I try my best to mm -hmm. to discuss those things with people like right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Is making sure, I mean, that's, that's the point really of, of Wraparound Wadarapa, this, this radio show, is to, to bring all the different services that we have in the community in one place so that we can actually start you know, telling the story about what's out there for people. I think one thing that we do know, um, and and I see it almost on a daily basis, is we've got some really good services and we've got some great stuff out there happening in the Wadarapa, mm -hmm. but not everybody, and actually not even all the healthcare uh, workforce, know about what those services are. So bringing those to the fore a little bit more um, is really important so people know what they can access. I'll tell you, that has been my biggest challenge. When I first took the role, It's it's been nearly a year and a half, um, the first few people who I met with said, can, is there any way that you could get people connected with people? It, you know, um, They were sharing their stories. Oh, my, my father needed this and we didn't know who to call, or my daughter needed this and we didn't know who to reach, and we were told to go here or told to go there and um, I thought oh yeah I'll take care of this and I thought I could have it sorted overnight and it's not that way at all there's so many layers and so many f funding sources and so many um, sometimes unfortunately people working in a vacuum so maybe doing duplicate things so getting all those people pulled together has um, been a real challenge and even for myself to navigate who's who. Um, but there are some good things that come of people coming together too. For instance, I, I believe, let me just check the date, it's March 20th, there's going to be a big Age Concern Expo in Carterton, and there are going to be plenty of stalls. And so, as I said earlier, that's such a huge percentage of our population. And even if you're not in the senior age group, um, you probably have a parent or a neighbor or some uh, family member or something who is. So that will bring a huge number of people out in the community and getting those communications going and those networks sorted. That's what we need a little bit more of, I believe, yeah, so you absolutely. can see what's out there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I'm working on that um, in the background, actually, because this, this conversation has been happening for years, and it's certainly not just us that, that understand that there's so much more out there than we even know about. Um, Everybody, everybody understands the the layers. You were talking about the layers of services and, and what's that. Everybody knows that there is just so much. It's all a muddle. So, making some sense of that, I think, and getting everybody out out from their silos. You're talking about working in a vacuum. We have got duplication in the community of people doing the same sorts of things, effectively and brilliantly. But let's 
bring it all together. So yeah. I'm working on that in the background uh, in terms of we, we'd like to pull a web uh, site together that actually um, in a very easy to navigate way for people um, to find their way around what services are available. So hopefully by the end of the year we'll pull all that together in, in, in one website. Hosted probably on the DHB website but available by its own URL so people can just search and grab it. This Wraparound Wire Wrapper show is the start of that. It's, yeah. it's about actually this is this we all get, need to get to know each other more yeah uh, from a business perspective I think that was the first step let's all see what everybody's doing yeah and my key part where my passion is is put myself in the people's shoes so what do our community need to know right. look at it from the consumer perspective and then go actually how do I want to receive this information and if I'm in a certain position where I need some assistance of some sort what's my easiest way of going somewhere where I can clearly see yeah. what's available for me right so I think we're part way down the track of getting all the services that are out there to know what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step is to make sure that they're then visible and easy to access for the consumer. So it is a big chunk of work. It is a difficult thing. It's something that we've been struggling with for a long time. And we're not alone. Um, this is a, a nationwide thing. I yep. mean, I think every every region, every area would feel the same. Sure. So that brings us back to disability. So we're having that conversation now about um, able-bodied people with a high health literacy level struggling to know what's out there so then putting ourselves in the shoes of somebody who is not an able-bodied per person either they lack mobility or or they're, they're I mean there's so many versions of, of disability isn't yes, there so yes. deafness and blindness and intellectual and mobile and and there's probably loads more yeah uh, what else makes a disabled person well what, what are we and that that is um that is a very malleable kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. It it changes on who you're talking to. Uh, to be honest, even in meetings with people who have worked in this space for a long time, people can have different opinions about that. That's why I kind of stick to my um, access to um, curriculum, community, and quality of life definition. Mm -hmm. um, so it is all of those things, those sensory uh, disabilities, um, mobility, um, intellectual, um, m some mental health challenges can fall into that um, and then also chronic health conditions that mm -hmm. go on for six months or longer fall into disability but again you know different people have different opinions about mm -hmm. those types of things but but when you are not accessing a quality of life and you need some sort of um, support um, to access the things that you need to access mm -hmm. is, is what I consider uh, mm -hmm. a disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we I think we 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 have all the best intentions, but getting the action to make it happen is difficult. And, and as I explained, even even for those of us that are very health literate, we find it difficult. So so for the disabled in our community, it must be it must be a real challenge. And that's why we have you and the wonderful team that you work with, and all the neat advocacy work that's happening. And what we're calling for now, I guess, um, and and always have been, is to make sure that businesses and organisations and individuals all understand the importance of that equality, making it all equal and accessible. For for, for everybody. It is, and, yep. and I, I also want to add, and this is just a little bit of um, a personal opinion, is there there are funding sources and, and um, there are uh, ways to get funding for your family if you need help. Mm -hmm. But another thing to think about is, what is it that you want to use that funding for? And that's where I think we need to have more conversations about actual person-to-person, community-type direct service providing, where, for instance, you know, I'm fortunate enough to fortnightly be part of a group of young adults who um, may have some, some challenges, and um, they are relatively on their own. They're uh, generally between the ages of 18 and, and maybe their early 30s and except for the times that we meet and go out and do miniature golf or go out and, and have a bite or something like that they're on their own and they live very um, isolated lives. So Vicki how have, how's that group established? How, how have you found these people and connected? Well, how did that I, happen? I fortunately um, when I first moved to the Wadadapa almost four years ago
formed a relationship with um, Autism Wadadapa. Mm -hmm. And the two ladies who are part of that organization do a lot of social engagement groups like this. They have support groups and da-da-da-da. And so one of the ladies talked about starting this, um, it's, I don't know how long, maybe nearly two years ago. I, I don't know exactly. And I said, oh, I'd love to be part of that. So she invited me to be be part of that. So um, just things like that that go on in the community are are what we need more of. I understand that people um, want funding and support for their families, but we also need to be able to make sure there's funding there for actual direct services and, you know, maybe training for young people or, um, you know, intervention services for, for children or whatever it might be, where we're actually providing personal direct engagement with people and not just talking about it, but actually taking the actionable steps to uh, include everyone in the community. Mm. And we do know something that COVID taught us, um, that dreaded COVID word that we can't seem to um, to not use in almost every conversation. But one thing that COVID taught us, of course, was loneliness. Those people that are out there that are on their own in the community, are, and, and of course people can be lonely in amongst a lot of people, can't they? So it's around that connection, oh. building those connections and having that, that social aspect to life, which brings in the quality of life business. I mean, you can provide all that you need in a home to get around, the ramps and the, and the bathroom, whatever you need um, to be able to get around. But if you haven't got that social connection, you're not going to have that quality of life, are Didn't you? Didn't COVID you, shine a light on that? Absolutely. And so, and, I, and uh, you know, I think as a nation, we have really grasped and understood that. I think people really have yeah. uh, understood now the value of connection a lot more than we have before. And I think... I don't know how rural fits into disability, but I know that some of our isolated rural communities, that was a real challenge around COVID. You know, we do, and in what it up we do, we have people that live in quite isolated communities um, and connecting with them was quite, was quite difficult. We also have a hard to reach community, um, which, is, which is difficult, our gangs, so, you know, those sorts of things. We've got a lot of people that are really difficult to connect with, people that aren't necessarily engaged in health services. So we don't necessarily even know that they are out there yeah. um, and so that's for the abled as well as the disabled Absolutely. but there's a lot of work to do I think and COVID really really did um, illustrate that is that there's a lot to work to do just on on pulling those threads together to connect people to mainstream services that are, that are there. Well that is that is one of the challenges for the Wadarapa is our um, geographic size mm. and the distance that people have um, to travel and getting people to the services that they need and, and all of that, um, that is a unique challenge to us. Although we do have, you know, some buses, you know, you can take the bus from Martin Road to Masterton and all that good stuff, but um, it, it is a challenge because we are so spread out. We have so many rural pockets, mm. yeah. Mm. Beautiful valley, but it does have its challenges, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, when you have disabilities or you have some um serious medical needs it, it does have challenges mm, yeah mm. so tell me what about um one of the key things i often think about is if i'm in a business or a service organization that's providing uh customer service and someone comes to me and they're either blind or they're deaf how do i communicate with them what tools are available for the joe blog business person to be able to connect with a disabled person in that in that situation well, I know it sounds really silly and simple, but our biggest message is just ask. Mm -hmm. If, if um, you find someone who has a challenge, they have um, a, you know a, an issue with uh, blindness or low vision or or deafness or mobility or whatever it might be, um, just ask how you can help or how you can be of assistance. And um, that's really all people want is that respect of maybe not assuming what you need or being nervous about asking um it's just it's typical of any of us that if um you know if i drop something on the floor and somebody says oh would you like me to pick that up for you um it's it's the same thing you just ask the question and um, people will tell you 
what their needs are, um, or that they're fine and they don't need anything at all. Mm -hmm. It's just being open to that conversation and having the courage to just ask. What are your thoughts on sign language and whether or not it should be mandatory for children in the in the general education curriculum? There's some discussion around whether people should have to learn sign language. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think sign language is um, a really great tool for very um, small children who aren't verbal yet. It's really fun. I think a lot of parents experiment with, with doing that and getting that communication started early. Um, to be honest, when it comes to the schools, I'll just be honest with you. I think that the schools really have so much on their plates. If if you look at the population of just your average um, decile school, the full inclusion model leaves a teacher with any number of students in there who may have learning disabilities or any other uh, type of disability in the classroom already that they are having to differentiate instruction for, make modifications for, um, and to be honest with you, without a whole lot of funding support or service support. So it's left on the teacher to make those services available in their own room without maybe not even having any specialist training in it. So asking that extra layer of having to teach something like sign language to me might be a little bit much I think we have other things we need to sort out first yeah yeah I agree with you how busy the schools are it is absolutely crazy what they the poor old teachers need to contend with and what they're expected to deliver absolutely it's it's pretty it's pretty horrific isn't it actually yes. having worked at um, our very own Wadarapa College I love Wadarapa College I think it's it's a great school and uh, I worked there for some time for about oh, a couple of years in the um, in the language unit uh, so I, I tutored and taught um, kids that were having um, reading disability and learning disability and I did some extra work with them and then I also tutored some of the ones that were sort of at the top of the scale and uh, oh. did some extension work so I did a little bit of both and yeah. it was just fascinating um, the amount of support that was provided out of scope for these kids that are both ends of the of the scale you That's know it was, it was it was brilliant um but certainly having been immersed in that culture of what up college and being on staff for a period of time i saw how really busy and dedicated teachers are and i think we do tend to sort of sit back and go oh, the schools should deliver that that's something people need to learn in schools i think we do that quite a bit don't we so yeah i think if we put those types of efforts and resources that we do maybe in the upper age groups as you're mm -hmm. describing mm -hmm. if we put that in the primary age groups we wouldn't maybe necessarily have such a need when they're uh, exactly. a lot so, of those problems yeah, can be sorted develop it young and and of course it's going to take a long period of time to come through the years as those kids grow but then becomes the norm ultimately it's yeah. cost effective yeah yep. absolutely yeah it's just one of those things isn't it and sign language is just is just one illustration but it does make you realize that you know for our deaf community how challenging life must be oh yes you know, um, and for those that are, are non-sighted or have poor sight and, you know, all of those different challenges that people have yep. must be all-consuming at times when they're trying to um, struggle their way through mainstream life and it's just not set up for them. I do not take it for granted. Several of my teammates um, over on my Wellington team mm. um, have disabilities. You would never think about them that way in the sense that they have challenges they can't overcome because they absolutely have overcome them and they they're amazing and I'm just in awe of what they're able to to do and contribute all the time mm, mm. and that's fantastic so what can we do listeners is the last two minutes of, of the radio show what can we do to help as an individual well, our listeners out there, what can they do to make life better for our disabled community? Well, again, ask if you have a question, if you have a neighbor, um, maybe a check on people who you think might be um, isolated. Um, and if you are out and about in public, ask the question if you see somebody who's maybe struggling with the door or something like that. Um, just those simple types of things. Um, being open to... Um, the, the equity question, thinking to yourself, what what do we need to do as a community to make sure everyone has fair and, and um, equitable access 
to, to just being conscious of your neighbors really absolutely and that's a brilliant message and we have one minute to go and I'm going to pull it in to my particular um, bugbear is people parking in mobility car parks oh. Right, so that's a big baddie, right? So it we is. know that. Oh gosh! But there's been a whole heap of work in the last few years gone into that. There's that mobility car park number that you can ring to report people. There's all sorts of good stuff that you can do if you do see able-bodied people without a mobility sticker permit yes. on their car, yes. parking in a car park. It will be your your um, your number will be recorded. Your your uh, car license will be recorded and. Um, it's just, it's really, it's, it's just such a selfish thing to do and a thoughtless thing. Um, recently at the hospital, we had some people who took advantage of the car parks that they shouldn't. And we had to have volunteers go out and assist physically people with mobility issues in the larger car park to get into the hospital so when you're taking a disability car park you're doing that to someone else Absolutely. so just be conscious of that shocking isn't it yeah it's one simple thing if it's yellow and it's got the wheelchair sign you don't park there exactly if you don't need it ah, there you end go. of story vicky it's been wonderful having you on the show oh thank, thank you. you so much for coming oh thank you for having me vicky smith our disability advisor and anybody needing to know a little bit more about how we can support our disabled in the community you can go on to the Wairarapa DHB website uh, and then hit there Your Health and, and Disability uh, and there's a whole heap of information and that's how you can access Vicki Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you.